Welcome everyone to breakout session B1. I hope you enjoyed your time networking. We have an exciting panel lined up for you discussing food, tech, and sustainability, crafting what's next from California to Europe. And I'd like to introduce our moderator, Siobhan Hansen, who is food choice architecture and nutrition manager for Google Food. So much, Katie. Uh, really appreciate that. So I too want to welcome everyone to today's session. Again, food, technology, and sustainability. Crafting What's Next from California to Europe. We've got a great panel uh, today, including people from California as well as an individual from Europe. So let me set up the session for us. Uh, we'll look at both the future of food and tech as it relates to investment, product development, and sustainability, as well as the food program and related sustainability strategies of leading companies within the tech sector. A few things we want to explore are the extent to which plant forward corporate food program strategies have been initiated in the tech sector, and then turn to the front lines of both plant based meat innovation and the rapidly advancing technology around cellular meat. We're going to ask how much can we expect both of these to scale in the marketplace and impact the future of restaurant and food service menus, and how might high tech coexist in the future with low-tech, culturally rooted, whole food, plant-forward menu development. So there's some tension there be between those two, and we want to tease that out. So I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, first, we have Anna Bobot, Global Food Program Manager from LinkedIn and the founder of Women in Tech Food Group. And Anna, if we've got some time, we'll want to dig into that. Uh, Anna is the former chef, cooking and nutrition instructor, published cookbook author, and certified holistic nutrition consultant in the Bay Area. We've got Larissa Zimbaroff. She's a freelance journalist covering the intersection of food, technology, and business. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, and more. And she's the author of the newly published book called Technically Food, Inside Silicon Valley's Mission to Change What We Eat. It's a great read, and um, we'll definitely dig into that. And then Robert Jones joining us from the Netherlands. So both Larissa and Anna are in California, um, and Robert is in the Netherlands, where he's the head of public affairs for Masa Meat, pioneers of cell-cultured meat. He's the former regional director from the Environmental Defense Fund. And Robert is also the co-founder of Cellular Agriculture Europe, a Brussels-based trade association representing cultured meat companies across the continent, and is a proud graduate of CIA Greystone. Um, so we are, welcome each of you all. And I just want to get started um, with a brief question to each of you. If you can tell us a little bit about yourself and what key experiences got you to where you are today. And let me toss it to Anna to get us started. Sure, thank you for having me. Happy and excited to be here. Um, I've worked in food as long as I have been able to work. Um, front of house, back of house, I got my hands dirty, all of the above, but with a passion for nutrition as well. And once I was in corporate dining and you see the large volumes of food being produced in order, sustainability started started being something that I became very passionate and inquisitive and wanting to learn more. So little by little in eight years uh, that I've been at LinkedIn, I've learned a ton um, from the corporate dining perspective. So I'm happy to be here. Great. Larissa. Hi. Um, you know, I wish I had worked in, in food, but the only food I can I can say is in my past is a frozen yogurt job when I was 16. Um, but uh, one of the things I write about in my book is that I have type one diabetes and being someone with diabetes means I'm looking at food in a much different way, much more rigorously. Um, in the book, I say that I see through food. And so like, it's very exciting what's happening today in our um, food world, but where we had, you know, farm to table and like kind of an, uh, a push towards transparency, we've got this food tech that is becoming really complicated. Um, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to try to uncomplicate these new foods. Awesome. That's great. And you do a great job of that. You're right. There is this tension that we're seeing. And I, I hope to unpack that a little bit. Robert, over to you. Brief intro. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, 
how I got here today. I, I worked in politics in the US uh, for nearly 20 years, uh, government affairs and advocacy. And a big part of that was working on sustainable sea, seafood and oceans issues. And I really loved the work, but as part of that, I really got a glimpse of the serious challenges in our food system writ large on land and in water. Uh, and you mentioned I was a graduate of CIA, which I'm very proud of. I went to culinary school with no intention of ever being a cook. I, I don't really don't have the backbone for that. I respect people who do it. Um, but I wanted to immerse myself into the food system in a new way. Um, and really uh, understand uh, that end of the food supply chain as part of my journey of working uh, towards really innovative, innovative alternative uh, protein, which is what we're doing at Mosa Meat. So I'm excited to be on the panel today and, and, and really looking forward to it. Great, well, thank you all. Such interesting perspectives that we've got um, around the table today. So Larissa, let me start with you. Your book cover covers so much, everything from algae to fungi to pea protein, plant-based burgers, vertical farms, you name it. And I just wondered what new foods are you most excited about? What's got the most potential and is really getting you energized? Yeah, it's probably the one I had to learn the most about, which was mycelium or fungi. So it's my second chapter. And, you know, you might hear the, some catchphrases coming about, which is like mycoprotein. You'll also hear uh, precision fermentation. Um, so there's these like sort of techno words that are being associated to it. But what I what I really um I'm excited about microproteins are that it's still from the natural world. So um, the mycelium is the underground root network in the forest floor and the mushrooms are the, are the fruiting bodies that come from that. And so this mycelium can be tapped and then grown indoors. So it is being, you know, kind of brought inside in a manufacturing kind of um, facility, but it's still, it's, it's, it has a very direct link. And you may know about it, especially because this is the CIA's conference, Menus of Change, you're really interested in plant-based, is corn, Q-U-O-R-N, which is based on this mycoprotein. So they were one of the earliest people to bring it to market. It took time, right? But now it's one of the mo most popular protein sources, like, you know, chicken tenders and things like that. Um, but I'm, I'm so excited about mycoprotein because it doesn't need a lot of post-processing. So once it's grown, uh, then only a little bit needs to happen and only a little bit needs to be added. So I think it has a ton of potential and I'm excited about it. Also, it has a little fiber in it in addition to protein and fiber is what the diet is missing the most of. Oh, good point. We heard that yesterday um, from Dr. Eric Rim, that fiber feeds the microbiome. So yeah. very important point. So awesome. Great. Well, again, the book explains so many different opportunities, and I'm sure you had a lot of fun exploring and investigating. Let me move over to Robert, and if the audience can also start to populate the chat with questions that you all might have. I'm going to keep going on the ones I have until I <clears throat> see some pop, uh, pop up, but keep us going there. So Robert, for you, let's talk a little bit about your world, the uh, cellular cultured meat. Um, mm -hmm. What does it mean to sell culture meat, and why should consumers even consider it? Yeah, great question. Uh, well, I'm really proud to work for Mosa Meat because our founder pioneered this technology. Uh, he introduced the world uh, to the first cell cultured hamburger uh, on a London stage in 2013. Uh, and, and, and the way the technology works is that we can take like a peppercorn size sample uh, from a living cow without hurting it, um, less than a gram uh, of muscle tissue. Uh, and then move away from, from the, the cow and into a facility where we take those, that sample of cells and we trick them basically and tell them to either grow into fat tissue or into muscle tissue um, and put them in a nutrient rich broth uh, where they, in a, in, a, in a bioreactor that's basically a stainless steel tank, it, it looks just like a beer brewery, imagine that. Um, and so, and then we can grow uh, from that peppercorn size sample uh, of tissue, we can grow 80,000 hamburgers. Um, and in the process of doing that, especially if the facility is powered by renewable energy, it's at about a 93% lower carbon footprint, 98% less land, 78% less water, 
uh, 93% uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions than what it would take to raise livestock to get beef the conventional way. Um, so it's really a game changing technology. Um, and the second part of your question is why would consumers consider it? Um, well, I always think about the bell curve that we have all seen, uh, the diffusion of innovation. Um, and, and there are a group of people, like 2.5% of consumers that are the innovators, uh, about 13% of people who are early adopters. I think those people uh, are going to try, they're going to be itching to try this uh, because they're motivated by reasons like climate change, um, animal welfare, um, that they're looking for alternative protein. They love meat. They're not ready to go plant-based, they, but they want meat that is guilt-free. Um, and so I think that crowd is easy. Where it gets harder is the next 34% of consumers, which are considered to be uh, the early, uh, uh, sorry, the early majority. Um, and that's the chasm that we've got across. Um, and all of the research that's been done so far indicates that consumers are excited about this. And the more they learn, the more they are receptive to it. The challenge we have thus far is that it's only been approved in one place in the world, and we're not ready to introduce it just yet. Um, we're, we're getting close to going to market. So people can't try it and touch it and taste it just yet, but mm -hmm. I have tasted it and it's amazing. Uh, uh, you know, and I, and I think people are really going to jump at this opportunity uh, for, for all sorts of reasons. Can you tell us how far away we are? Yeah, I, most there's about 70 companies in the world now uh, that are working on this technology across different proteins, chicken, duck, pork, uh, beef. Uh, and I know a number of companies like ours are looking to submit uh, dossiers for regulatory approval um, before the end of this year. Um, and so pending regulatory approval, you're, you should be seeing more and more uh, cultivated meat on the market in the next two, three, four years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're getting close. So Anna, let me toss this over to you because um, Robert talked about these early adopters and I just want to know how you get buy-in on the chef and customer or your user side for um, these kinds of interesting products. I mean, are they well accepted and is your ecosystem at LinkedIn um, really looking to products um, like those that Robert's discussing? Uh, yeah, we aren't um, against toying and playing and tasting and sourcing these products. Um, there's still a lot, you know, that we're going to learn as more and more of them get. And so uh, we're very curious and eager to see what they look like. Um, and we we definitely do offer meat alternatives in all of our food program around the world. Um, and uh, it, it provides a lot of variety for, for the meat eaters and the flexitarians and the vegetarians and the vegans to be able to try new products that they probably wouldn't be able, wouldn't be able to or would, would be less inclined to purchase on their own. So there's a big benefit to that, um, to be able to offer the opportunity for folks to be exposed to new products that they probably wouldn't buy on their own or taste on their own. Um, for our program, the focus is on fresh, seasonal, high quality, whole, real foods that are responsibly sourced as the primary driver. So we start there and we look at what are we sourcing uh, with respect to proteins? What are we currently sourcing? Because we purchase in such high volumes, we could be making a bigger impact by looking at what we're already getting. And so we look at that, um, at the quality, where's it coming from? Um, do we need, could we make smarter, more scalable decisions first before we start peppering in all these food-like products or new products on the market? And if the purchase volumes need to be adjusted due to the inability to source a quality product, because, you know, every program around the world everywhere has budgets, right? Um, if we can't purchase, you know, all high quality of one thing, then we look at the quantity of what's being offered and we can treat the protein more as a condiment, which ties really well into the whole plant forward initiative where we make smarter choices about what we're offering. Um, and with our future program, with having more plated options instead of buffet, I think we have such room for opportunity to be able to finally do that scalable, sustainable way to source these high quality products and treat, treat the proteins more like condiments. 
Great, thank you, Anna. We've got some good questions rolling in here specific um, for Robert. Uh, but let me just ask you one more thing, Anna, as it relates to the chefs and the chef teams. Any just thoughts, knowing that our audience is operators and chefs themselves, kind yeah. of recommendations about how you've garnered um, excitement around Balance Plant Forward, this whole foods way of eating. I mean, tips and recommendations you might have just at a high yes. level. Collaboration and transparency is key, um, including chefs uh, and uh, your operators as part of the process for strategy development, sharing your strategy with them. You know, it's one thing to be told what to purchase and how often to offer it on your menu, but it's another thing to fully understand the why and to understand where we're trying to go. Uh, I think having that exposure uh, gets more buy-in. I mean, it definitely worked with with our program. Um, it's education, transparency, getting full buy-in, um, and that's from the internal side, the chef side, and having them be a part of the process of tasting the products, experimenting with the products, giving their feedback. It's it's key. You know, you're you know when a chef it's proud of a dish when they put it out and they serve it. Um, and you know, like you have that feeling, you can taste it, right? So if they're proud of the products that they're using, it's gonna come through in the food. And right. so um, on the consumer side, having very robust marketing and communication has been very successful for us. We themed our plant forward rollouts. Uh, we called the, the stations different names. One was sustain, where you sustain your body and you sustain the earth. Um, and we're very thoughtful in our tone and in communication. We sent weekly newsletters to keep the conversation going and provide an avenue of feedback back to the program uh, managers, um, not just to the chefs, but it trickled all right. the way up. And, and so we got true, a true grasp of how it was being received and what could be better. Um, what was very successful from the consumer side was plated dishes. And that also provided the cooks the opportunity to pepper in a couple of really elevated products into those plated dishes because of the quantity control. Yeah. Great, really great suggestions. I think it's so helpful. It sounds like a very holistic approach, really supporting the chefs and in, in their journey. So let's turn to a question by Pamela Reynolds. Um, and we've got here, so cell culture question mark. Hmm, most cell lines that culture are vastly different from the primary source. Any thoughts on how cultured meat differs from the hoof? And lastly, how does cultured meat get us more plant forward? I think right. You alluded to that on the sustainability side, Robert, but do you want to address this one for us? Sure, it's a great one. Thank you, Pamela. Um, so I can only speak for, for our company because I haven't tried any other companies and every uh, cultivated meat company is using a different technology and process for what, whether they're using cell lines, immortalized cell lines, et cetera. For, for, for us, what we have done is, you know, we take a, a sample of cells from muscle and fat tissue um, and use that as the source. And then uh, the, the end product is under a microscope is exactly the same. Uh, it does not uh, it, you know, we have differentiated into those two. We've grown them separately. And then we're starting with hamburgers. Um, and so we recombine those, the fat and muscle back together to get the texture, the taste, uh, and exact same nutritional value and composition uh, uh, as the original source. Um, for your second question, um, great one. And our take on this is that, you know, we think people ought to be eating less red meat. I mean, we all can agree that that, that dietary recommendation is a good one. Um, in order to meet the very robust challenge we have in the climate crisis and try to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Accord, we have to deal with the role that industrial animal agriculture plays. And it is not realistic, in my point of view, to get consumer behavior to change to a plant-based diet fast enough to meet those goals. And this is an intermediary step. Um, yes, I think everyone should eat less meat, but people who really crave meat and are looking for an analog to it, this is a perfect stepping stone that is a much better carbon footprint. So um, I, I think, you know, uh, long term, we will have stronger plant based diets uh, and meat consumption will will peak and decline and, and these sorts of analogs will start to take over that trend. 
in the immediate step in the next 20 years, we're not going to reach the goals that we need to unless we have this sort of solution as part of the toolbox, not the only tool. Thank you so much, Robert. It's so great that you speak um, with the knowledge of uh, you know your past experiences and also your chef um, training. I just I think it's critical for this conversation to really have the under, deep understanding of, of both. Larissa, let me just move over to you, ask you another question. It seems like everyone's focused on the next hot protein. Is this what our food system needs from your perspective? We've got you on mute thoughtful by being on mute. Um, the protein dilemma and our need for protein has been going on since the 70s when a diet for a small planet came out. And uh, Francis Moore LaPay pointed out that we get more than enough protein, right? So it's we're, we keep on talking about protein like it's this, this magic thing that we need. It's very like, you know, it helps us recover. It helps us get stronger. You know, it's got many masculine traits. And to me, I don't worry about protein. I just know I'm going to get it. And there's protein in plants, right? So the it's the need to eat meat. It's the need to have that texture that is different from protein. And the American diet is missing fiber, as I mentioned, which mostly comes from fruits and vegetables and whole fruits and vegetables, right? If you want prebiotic, right, which feeds your microbiome, you need whole fruits and vegetables because it comes from the skin and it comes from the, the fibers that are in that whole plant. Um, if I have a Beyond Meat burger made from pea protein, that pea protein has been stripped of its parts. It's it's less than it once was, right? It's now, now only its protein. And so it isn't giving me prebiotic fiber. It isn't giving me fiber. It isn't giving me the nutrients of a pea. It's now something entirely different. And um, our food is becoming now ingredients, right? And, and, and as I look at macronutrients, protein, fat, carbohydrates, and it's almost like people are looking at macronutrients, but they're only looking at protein. And so I think that um, as, as Anna mentioned, this like holistic review of like what's on the plate, um, mm -hmm. as long as you eat a really varied diet, including if you want cultured meat and you don't eat meat that often, right? It, as varied as possible, as much, you know, as many plants as you can fit in on your plate, like that's where you're gonna get like the best diet. And I think that um, <clears throat> we, we haven't gotten, because of the exercise craves and that need for protein and that need for, you know, fuel, right? We just haven't gotten out of that trap. And I, I do think that there's some ways that cultured meat feeds into that. Um, it doesn't help us get, get a healthier diet, right? Our American diet isn't something that we want to be rewarded for, right? It's not good. It's not good for the planet and it's not good for our bodies. And so, yeah, I think that, you know, I wrote the book to have us talk about this and put a bigger spotlight on these new foods. Great, thank you. Robert, quick question for you. What are the biggest challenges you're facing now with cell-cultured meat? Yeah, it, that's a great question and it ties in with a couple of things in the chat I wanted to address. Um, so the, the, the single biggest challenge is a, is a technology challenge right now and that's in scaling up um, the technology. We can, uh, we can grow, uh, almost everybody can grow smaller amounts of meat right now easily. It, the challenge is scaling up to meet the sort of demand that that we envision would equal real change in the food system. And so um, that challenge is mostly rooted in the growth medium, um, which there's, is referenced in the chat a couple of times. Um, when this technology was originally invented, the only sort of uh, nutrient rich growth medium where you could the, the cells could proliferate was um, using what's called fetal bovine serum. Uh, and and it, there's all sorts of reasons why there's a problem with that, uh, but it was it was an intermediary step in doing the research and development. Um, but our goal and every company that I know of its goal is to get away from using any sort of animal serum in the growth medium. And we've already done that. We we announced that last year. And so we're working on a plant based growth medium. Uh, and, and now it's just taking that and getting the cost on the plant-based growth medium down to the point where as we scale up, we can go to market with a product that is, is close to price parity with conventional meat. At first, um, almost all conventional products will, be, be, will garner a premium. 
Um, mm -hmm. But cons thoughtful consumers are used to that. I mean, uh, uh, you know, a pound of, of grass-fed hamburger meat is about 300% more than a pound of conventional uh, hamburger meat. Um, it will start at a premium, and then as we scale, almost immediately, the, the price starts to go down, and we'll be at parity or below conventional meat uh, within just a few years. And that's the sweet spot where you start to get adoption to the point that we're achieving the sort of sustainability goals that I talked about earlier. Okay, so we're even a few years away from that though, because we need to get it in the marketplace first, but then have all of these learnings and the evolution and, and consumer understanding. So, I mean, are you talking what, six years away from having that place where, where it's price parity potentially? I don't think it'll be that long. Um, actually, McKinsey, the big global consulting firm, released a report last week uh, that predicts by 2030, cultivated meat will make up, uh, up $25 billion of the meat market. Now, that's a small amount out of 1.4 trillion, uh, but then it rapidly grows from there. Um, so uh, these are all predictions. I don't know, uh, but you know, I think uh, you. I think you're going to see this technology proliferate pretty rapidly, um, uh, and and we all of these companies. I mean, again, most of me introduced the world to this technology in 2013, and to give you a sense, it cost three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars to make that burger um, in 2013. Um, wow. Eight years later, we are orders of magnitude below that and close to entering the market at a premium price. Okay. So just think about how far the technology has come so rapidly. Sure, sure. That's great. Anna, let me toss it one over to you. And that is really just when you step back and think about your program at LinkedIn, how do you all grapple with decisions around um, taking a stand on cellular meat or algae or any of these interesting ingredients or approaches that you're not currently using? What, what's the process or the method, if you can share? Uh, yeah, I mean, the food world is evolving always. And so to have a solid stance that never changes would be quite the challenge. I, uh, however, we remain truly focused on whole real ingredients that are seasonal and uh, sustainably sourced or responsibly sourced. And uh, the most responsibly sourced that we can uh, is, is what we try to aim for, no matter what's coming on the market and what new hot food items are, are coming out. Um, and so we, the, F, being a global food, food program manager, our team has to be very mindful about different cultures around the world and you know uh, the nuances around the world because the American <laughs> diet is completely different than than you know the diet in Europe and in Latin America and so we have to be culturally conscious we have to be um behaviorally <laughs> conscious uh what are the different behaviors and you know thoughts and and how are people thinking about this around the world before we would ever create any type of global approach to sourcing these products um, so it's a collaborative process with the global lens, um, keeping in mind that culture, tradition, you know, traditional foods as well are all considered as part of, of the strategy behind behind um, coming up with the stance, if that kind of answers the question. <laughs> I know it, it's helpful. I mean, it's, it's not easy. It's not straightforward yeah. for sure. Um, but you've given us some good perspective on how you think about this. Robert, I want to ask you, and then there's a great question in the chat too for Larissa. It's really along the same lines. And my question for you, Robert, is can you talk about the tension between cell-based, kind of the high-tech approach and the whole foods approach that Anna is representing from her food program as a chef in particular? How do you approach that tension? What would you want Anna to be thinking about um, in the chefs in the audience? Um, and then, Larissa, if you can get ready, you see the, the comment in the chat about specifically for you about chef adoption um, happening in the future. So it's really along the same lines. But Robert, start and then we'll have Larissa um, lean in. Yeah, well, I think I would challenge the premise of the question because I, I think people sometimes uh, subscribe tension where there's not. People are con constantly asking me about, well, what about farmers and the tension with uh, you know, this new technology. And I, I, I go back to my original point. It, it, our challenge in fixing the global food system is so great 
and the role that agriculture plays in climate change is up is above 30 percent um, we don't solve that and and address this existential crisis unless we use all the tools in the toolbox and Cultivated meat is one of those tools. We're not, we're no one in this this field is saying that it should replace all meat, uh, that it should that it's better than plant based, um, but it is a way to use innovation to immediately address a challenge. And so, for for anyone who's looking at food service and how to balance all of these different things, these competing interests, I, I would just advocate that it you know on your menu. Uh, that this is one of the things that could address the challenge that we all face and meet the needs and current and meet people where they are in their in their behavior. Um, and, and, and I really do believe that, you know, we have people who are not going to give up meat. Uh, and, and if they're not going to do that, let's at least give them a way to consume meat with a lower impact. And we also saw in the chat that people aren't going to go fully vegetarian either, <laughs> right? So there, there may be a progression. But Larissa, you're... Oh, thanks. sorry. Can I just add on really fast to Robert's comment too? Perfect. Yeah. I completely agree that it is a tool. Um, and I think the part where a lot of programs fall flat is that it's a tool that has not been thoroughly... Um, uh, the, the information about said tool is not thoroughly shared and the purpose behind it. And I think that's where the from the chef side, it's like, OK, if, if you were to replace your beef purchase one time per week with this product, this is the level of impact that we're making. And that's just one week. You know, we're open year round and we're serving 400 pounds of protein every day. Like let, that's, the, that's the level of impact that we're making. And so and then communicating that to the end user as well shows a much more thoughtful conscious decision making process um, and you're you're likely to get less pushback too in the entire process um, <laughs> this I think we could go a long time for this this one topic uh, you know I'll, I'll use a different word for Robert's toolbox which is hybrid so we're going to uh, see our supermarkets evolve into this very you know kind of overwhelming hybrid state, right? The, the one cultured meat that's available right now in Singapore is a chicken nugget that is made from partial cultured cells and partial plant protein. And it's a chicken nugget, so I can't say that I really feel like it's you know healthy, um, but it we're going to see this sort of hybrid approach happen. Um, to the question I got earlier, which is, you know, how, do, how what's chef adoption look like? There are obviously chefs interested in it. You know, Impossible launched just with chefs. You know, David Chang, um, Tracy Desjardins, and there are chefs that are interested in it. But I know that the majority of chefs are still very connected to their supply chain and really want to know as much as they can. Um, and that's not to say they're buying organic, but they know the guy that's making, that's growing the strawberry, right? So it's local. Right. So I think that this the, these new foods, what I call them in my book, it's this uh, wave of um, we no longer know who's who's making it, who who grew it, you know, because all the new foods need crops. So they do sub, do sub, um, depend on farming, but we will we will know less and less and less about what's coming. And I think chefs generally want to know more. And I think that Robert, you pointed out that every cultured meat company is doing it differently. Well, just imagine if we have to figure out how each of you, each of these companies are doing it and figure out which one's good, which one's, you know, like feeding me something that's healthy. Um, I mean, it's too much for me and I know a lot. Um, so I think that if chefs can, can push things forward like the Impossible Burger, chefs can also help us uh, temper that enthusiasm and make sure we're still connected to our roots. Great insight, really helpful. Um, Robert, any response back to? Uh, well, I think she's uh, on the hybrid topic. I think she's completely right. Um, you know, one, one of the the beauties of this technology is that you can you can cultivate anything, including just the fat. Um, and there's lots of potential there. If you want, you know, to to get flexitarians to eat more plant based, imagine making the you know a, a plant based burger with some animal fat in it, cultivated animal fat, um, in order to really generate the sensory experience that you would get um, from grilling a hamburger, for example. Um, so. I think that there's a lot of po possibilities here. 
Um, and, and you're completely right about, you know, there's a lot of information to parse through. Um, mm -hmm. We, it, 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 we plan on going into the restaurant market first because we see chefs as a great opportunity to educate consumers about this and work to introduce this in a smart way. Um, so that, that's going to be our approach. And I agree, uh, as soon as we finish our R and D get regulatory approval and get ready to go to market, there is a lot of work to do to educate people and parse through all of this information because it is complex. Um, yeah. but I have, I have faith in consumers that, it, that they will parse through this and they will be motivated to try this because they understand that the current way of doing it is not working. That's great. Really good perspective again from, from all three of you. Um, I, I've got a question for you all um, before we start to think about um, closing our time together. It's gone so quickly and has been so interesting. I want to ask what each of you all would like to share with the audience today as it relates to food, technology, and sustainability. If you just want to be sure that um, you have a chance to impart anything that you've not been able to share thus far. Let's, I'll just take Anna. You, sure. You want to. Yeah, um, you know, tying in climate change is, is in, into the communication and marketing is, is such a huge opportunity. And again, another area where operators tend to fall flat is the impact and mentioning, you know, how does one day's service affect, you know, the climate or, um, or how does one month's pur purchases of just dairy or protein? So just thinking about it that way and trying to come up with data points, I think will be really impactful for for uh, any program or restaurant, um, just to be able to speak to how thoughtful you're trying to be and where you want to go. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And um, soil health as well. So we're looking at proteins that you already source how could you improve the quality? Are there more regenerative products that you could be considering? Um, and give back to the, the health of the soil, which ultimately will help with, and you know, and will help with uh, climate change. So um, just trying to think of it holistically again, of, of where could you start? Where are some of the gaps that you could be filling in? And how are you going to get the buy-in and ultimately uh, educate and create change? Larissa and Robert yeah. very briefly, and we'll let I'll, Katie close us out. I'll jump in. Uh, I think that there are really, there's a big movement to work on the climate, especially with Biden in the White House. And that's exciting because, you know, I, it, it's been sort of stagnant for a while. And like, like food waste became kind of exciting, like maybe climate is now gonna become exciting and we can actually see visually, visibly that something is happening. And as soon as we get some stakes in the ground, that will help all these food companies kind of go towards that. Um, the problem is, is that the food companies have varying um, desires and, and mostly they are profit bound. So I think that, you know, the companies, these new companies that are bringing, bringing kind of technology, technological innovation to the market, they can, they can shine by being more transparent, by um, ensuring that not only is their mission based being the climate and industrial agriculture, but it's also my health. And so I feel like uh, human health is something that goes a little lower on the, the list of priorities. And we, as individuals, we watch out for our health. And um, I think that will continue um, for a while because I don't see anything really changing when we talk about big food or big corporations. Robert? Yeah, uh, quickly, I, I agree with that perspective. And as an American, but now who works in Europe, I, I will tell you that um, I'm concerned about the US falling behind in this game. Um, Europe is, is, I think, taking the kind of farm to fork re food system reform more seriously uh, and, and, and more robustly. Um, and, and I think it's a good model for the world to look at in the European Green Deal and the farm to fork strategy. Um, I, I often have a mantra in politics that first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then they join you. Um, and, and the good news is that I think we're starting to enter the they join you phase. Um, seeing some of the largest food service, food manufacturers in the world begin to open plant-based divisions, 
we're getting calls from some of the largest meat companies in the world asking about our technology, ask, asking about strategic partnerships. So I think change is coming and I think it's going to be fast from here on out. Awesome. Katie. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, it's been an amazing panel and we're not quite, so please stick with us. Um, I just wanted to pop in to give a couple housekeeping reminders. I know it's day two, so most of you are experts at this point, but going into our net networking break, which is coming up after this, just a reminder that on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see some opportunities for you. Um, in the networking tab, you can, you can network with peers, four-minute conversations, and our icebreaker for today is what steps are you or your company taking to reduce your carbon footprint? So you could chat about that or um, wherever your conversation takes you. Um, in the Innovation Hub, you can also um, go on to see more culinary uh, demonstrations as well as presentations. Uh, and uh, we're doing a Meet the Author with our own Larissa Zimbaroff. So um, I'll put the um, link to that in the chat in just a minute, but just a quick um, final round with everybody. If you could give us one top takeaway from this session, what would that be? I can start. I just want to applaud each of you as you're pushing the boundaries to explore the future of food and food service. I think this space people have to be brave and each of you have been very brave um, to share and explore. I think knowing each of you now allows the audience and all of us to be able to look to the expert and have the healthy, robust exchange. So I just want to, to thank each of you for that. I'll go. I can go. Oh. <laughs> I'll go. Um, it's just in our it's in each of our best interests to learn more as as food the food system is like propelling forward so rapidly um and with like, the pandemic that we just sort of were hit by and you know sort of continue to linger linger here um your health is you know your responsibility and so i i love the cia audience because i know that they're they're thinking about these things and we need to continue that and we need to continue the dialogue in greater greater amounts and greater greater number of places completely agree my main takeaway was um, we all need to continue to be open-minded because there's so much that's developing and we're learning and new data coming out and new products as well that could help tackle a lot of issues that we're facing around the world. Um, so open-minded, remain agile. So don't lock yourself into whatever program or restaurant or any offering that you have set up. Um, have it be flexible enough to be able to maintain agility as as new information and things come onto the market. Um, and remember that there's a push and pull to everything. So taking a holistic approach to your program or to whatever you're trying to do is, is really important. You know, doing something really well in one area might have a negative impact elsewhere. So remember the big picture and ultimately what your long-term vision is. Great. I, you know, I just wanted to say thank you to, to the panelists and, and the audience. Uh, this has been wonderful uh, and, and, and a great conversation. Uh, I am so proud to be a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America. Uh, and, and, and this conference is just one example of the incredible work that the, the school does. Um, you know, my top takeaway today uh, is, is very similar. Um, we all need to keep an open mind. Um, these challenges are really incredible and can be daunting and it's easy to just walk away and ignore them. Uh, but that's really not an option. So I choose to be optimistic. I choose to believe that in 20 years we will have met these challenges head on and the food system is going to look a lot greener, a lot more just uh, and a lot healthier. Thank you all. Yes. Um, and please join us in Larissa's Meet the Author session. The link is in the chat. And if you have any lingering questions, we can hopefully cover some of those as well as questions um, deeper diving into her book. So thank you all so much. Thank you to our panel. This has been a lot of fun. Um, and we'll see everybody either in networking or it, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much.